Alrighty y'all, welcome back to Country Fried Minis. I'm your host Cameron, the country boy in the big city, presenting to you once again from my temporary studio location on account of the repairs to my apartment. And today I'd like to talk to you about making the best of what we got. As some of you might have guessed from my paint kit in the previous video, I'm a bit of a fan of a game called Battletech. Now, like a lot of players, I got my start in this game by picking up an introductory box set. In my case, I picked up the Catalyst Games 2007 set. Now this set is great. It comes with a whole bunch of models, it comes with a rule book and dice and charts to get playing, but to my surprise, the quality of the models inside was really, really low. Firstly, I need to talk about the differences in quality between the 2014 introductory box set and the 2007 Classic Battletech introductory box set. Though both boxes come with the same models, the ones in the 2007 box are vastly inferior. Still, the selection of 24 mechs is a fantastic start for any Battletech player. I myself have taken the building lances exclusively from this set, and today's medium lance is no exception, but with a total battle value of less than 3,000 points. My only light mech here will be a PNT-9R Panther, followed up by an ASN-21 Assassin, a CDA-3M Cicada, and finally a CLNT-2-4T Clint. Together they form a total drop weight of 155 tons. Of course I've already pre-built this list, but I'd like to show you how you can cross-reference a few places and make sure your lance is ready for battle and era appropriate. Whatever faction I choose to play, I always check out masterunitlist.info to ensure that my chassis are appropriate for the faction. This particular lance is Free Republic Revolutionaries, who are aligned with the Capellan Confederation. Here I'll go ahead and open up that faction and navigate over to Clan Invasion, which is the era I'll be playing in. Once that opens up, I'll go ahead and press Ctrl F and start searching for the mech chassis by name. The same function is available with Command plus F for Mac users. Searching up the Clint, I can see that there's four options available, including the chassis that I want to use today. The Clint is known as a cheap recon unit with the capabilities of well-armed, low-end, medium-weight men. My particular chassis choice carries two AC-2s to whittle away at the enemy from a distance. Next, I'll go ahead and double check and see that the Panther is only available as the default PNT-9R. This is fine because it's the chassis I've chosen and it can still do some serious damage with its PPC and SRM4. Next up is my Cicada choice. Although it's also a light recon mech, this particular chassis has an Ultra AC-5 to put some serious hurting onto the opponent. And finally up is my Assassin. Though I've chosen the default chassis once again, the Assassin is known to be a superb reconnaissance and light mech due to its impressive top speed and solid firepower. And now that I've checked that all the choices are valid, I'm going to go ahead and load up Mega Mech to plug them in and get the battle value calculation correct. This is a fantastic program that allows for the creation of lists, single player games versus the AI, as well as multiplayer experiences through the internet. It's an open source program that's pound for pound basically the same thing as the tabletop game. Furthermore, this program is available for free at megamech.org. Here you can see I'm using the search feature under the Add a Combat Unit tab to go ahead and add the units that I've selected for this lens. It's pretty awesome to see all the choices laid out before you, and it's real easy to spend a lot of time finagling your force composition. And now I'm going to go ahead and add the faction color to these sprites to get a preview as to what the models are going to look like when they're all done and painted up. By double clicking on a unit here you can go ahead and do stuff such as adjust the gunnery and piloting skills, assign a portrait to your pilot, or click the random name until you get something you really like. Generally I'll spend a little time cycling through names until I find one that's just right to really help bolster my immersion experience. 
And finally, I'll save the list for quick recall later and ease of printing record sheets when I need to play them on the tabletop. With the software portion out of the way, let's go ahead and take a look at the models I have today. As you can see, the low grade plastic with which these models are made out of has led to some pretty horrific mold lines. It helps to make a mental note of where all these lines are on your models so you can have an easier time cleaning them up later. Although this is a process that's generally done with all model kits, the fact that these are made from toy grade plastic makes it particularly bad on this set. This plastic tends to be a little difficult to shave down and absolutely impossible to use a file to do the same task. For that, it's best to take your mental roadmap of all the mold lines and your sharp X-Acto blade and get to work scraping them down. Though I'm taking this time to go over every square inch of the models to know how much mold line scraping's ahead of me, I'm also using this opportunity to go over the mechs and take note as to where the weapons need to be modified to make all my chassis WYSIWYG. For those of you who don't know, WYSIWYG is an acronym that stands for What You See Is What You Get. Personally, I really like my models to show what weapons they have easily at a glance. This not only contributes to easy remembrance of what's in my army list, but ease of identification for my opponent as well. It's especially nice to do this in games such as Battletech that are so grindy and take so long to complete a single round. I'm a firm believer that for every second saved during the rules crunching portion of the game, you're going to gain back seconds in the fun and enjoyment portion of the game. Digressing, I'm going to get back to diligently removing even the most stubborn portions of these mold lines. Although it's really important to be meticulous in this portion, especially considering the low grade plastic of these models, it's real easy to let your mind wander during these mindless tasks. So for that, I say make light of it. Put on a podcast or some music or watch a movie in the background while you do this near effortless portion of the task. Now with this major portion of the cleanup done, it's time to set our sights on converting these models up to have accurate representations of the weapons presented on their chassis. For this conversion, I really like this Ultra Auto Cannon presented here on this Cataphract STL file. I think the triple barrel setup looks really good, so I'm going to try and replicate it using the tools I have at hand. In particular, I like the details on the tips of these toothpicks, so I'm going to go ahead and cut off the tips and line them up together so I can glue them in position. Once they're arranged in the right configuration with a little super glue, I'm going to hit it with a spritz of super glue accelerator to set the glue instantly. Taking this now assembled triad of gun barrels, I'm going to set it into the left torso of this cicada with a surplus of super glue. The surplus of glue in this case will help to shape out the base of the weapon and blend it a little better into the torso. Luckily, the back of one of these gun barrels hangs out just a bit more than the others and allows it to slot perfectly into the crevice on this mech's torso. Serendipitous, a perfect fit. Now that we've got these models cleaned up, it's time to go ahead and convert them into the variants we want using the supplies on hand and a little bit of green stuff. Oddly enough, my forays into 6mm scale wargaming have me doing an awful lot of sculpting with green stuff. So for that I've opted to go for this gigantic 100 gram package of green stuff by Gale Force 9 Hobbies. Since I'm working on conversions on machines rather than organic shapes, I've opted to make a stiffer mixture. To do that, I've simply used a little bit more of the blue portion while mixing these two parts together. Once I've got the two halves of the putty together, I'm going to make sure to take my time and mix it thoroughly. This stuff is extremely sticky, so it's a good idea to keep your fingers and your tools moist while working with this putty. Now, taking a little bead of the stuff and putting it where I want it to go, I'm going to aggressively jab at the edges to make it stick to the model. Once the edges of the blob are stuck to the model, we can use the side of our X-Acto blade to go ahead and start shaping up the lump. All the while remembering that this stuff is real sticky, real soft, and real fragile. I'm not a particularly talented sculptor myself, so keeping that last point in mind, I'm going to take a perfunctory approach to getting this done. Once I've got that little lump of putty formed into a shape that's close enough to evoke what I'm going for, I'll call it good enough. Besides, since green stuff takes a few hours to cure, you can always go back in an hour to an hour and a half to do a little more work on it when it's not quite as soft and sticky. 
taken that very approach, I've come back to this little lump when it's cured up just a bit and used the tip of a toothpick to put a hole evocative of a laser emitter. Having completed the medium laser housing on the right torso, I let it cure for a little bit and repeat the exact same process on the left side. Especially because this model is of potato quality to begin with, the sculpted weapons do not need to be perfect. In this case, good enough will be more than sufficient. Taking the lessons learned with the last two laser housings, we're going to go ahead and sculpt a small laser housing on this center torso of this mech. Due to the position of this weapon, we need to add a little bit more of an angle and bulk to the housing to make it stand out of the frame rather than simply face forward. Once this lump is in a vaguely teardrop shape, we can press on the front of it with the flat of the blade to help it rise up and give it the body that it needs. Now to help this blend in and make it a little more streamlined, I'm going to use a moistened fingertip to smooth out the sides of this rough weapon house. I'll then return back to the original tool to finalize the shape before using the tip of a toothpick to add the opening for the laser housing. These weapon ports may not be perfect, but they're good enough. They showcase clearly to myself and my opponent that this particular chassis has three weapons mounted on its torso. For the final bit of putty work on this here cicada, we're going to add a little band of green stuff to the three toothpicks here. That way this scratch built system looks more like a cohesive weapon system instead of three standalone barrels. And with that, this cicada is sufficiently WYSIWYG and reads as a CDA-3M chassis instead of the standard variant. Absolutely good enough. Now with the work on the cicada all wrapped up, let's go ahead and turn to the panther. The original sculpt is a representation of the base chassis, the PNT-9R Panther. This variant is meant to have an SRM4 in its center torso, but as you can see, this model only has two openings on the missile launcher. So let's kick back and watch this sped up footage of me turning this lump of green stuff into four missile ports for this mech. And with that, this lump of green stuff has become an SRM-4 launcher. Where this model was before improperly armed, now it's WYSIWYG. And speaking of WYSIWYG, our final modification today will be to drill two holes into the arm of this clamp. I'm using a 0.8mm drill bit here to get tiny holes. And with these tiny holes, I've turned this AC-5 arm into a dual AC-2. Now that the mechs are modified to be the correct chassis, it's time to talk basing. My personal go-to when considering Battletech models are these 30mm hex bases by Proxy Models. They're inexpensive and lightweight and have a nice reservoir on top to add some terrain once you've glued the mech down to the base. Furthermore, this baggie filled with convenient sprues, each with 8 bases on it, ensures that you have plenty to get multiple lances done. Of course, just like any other plastic model, once you've broken them off the sprue, take a little time and clean up the edges with a hobby knife. This is arguably even more important on a base rim since the final finish will be smooth and usually consisting of only one color. And now that they're all cleaned up, we're going to go ahead and affix these mechs to the bases using a surplus of super glue. It's good to go ahead and use a surplus of glue here to not only affix the mechs firmly to the base, but help build up some of the terrain as we go about detailing the base. But of course, that will become much more evident in the next step. And here they are, all ready to receive some fine base detailing. To make that base detailing, we're going to first start out with some lumps of green stuff and mount it up around the tab that's still connected to the mech's feet. After completely surrounding the mech's feet, we're going to fill the entire base with a layer of green stuff about an eighth of an inch thick. 
Now that we've smoothed it into a cohesive mound using a moistened finger, we're going to use our sculpting tool to push striations into the putty, evocative of rock strata. We're going to take our time and keep going around the circumference of the base, adding lines back and forth to build up this bold texture. The effect I'm intending to create here is one that evokes a shale deposit. I find that this is a very pleasing texture and reads quite well on this 6mm scale. As always, it's good to be super patient here and treat the green stuff putty with a lot of respect. After all, this stuff is super soft and super sticky, so again we need to remember to keep our tool moist the entire time. Now that we've finished this one texture, we're going to flip our tool around to the pick side and find a nice depression area on the base to add a second texture which will give it some visual interest. This texture can be even more time consuming than the previous step, so it's good to maintain our patience and maintain the moisture on our tool as we go about poking this base. And just like that, with a little effort and patience, we've created super rich textures that look awesome on these bases. Furthermore, they'll really take up the colors nicely when we get to painting them in the next video. In what seems like no time at all, we've got all four bases done and set aside to cure overnight. Finally, we're going to undertake the last part to beautify these models. All too often in the artwork of these mechs, they have antennas on their heads. It's interesting that such a small detail can add so much to the character of an individual chassis but yet it's the type of detail that's almost impossible to incorporate onto a sculpt. To add these important design elements only requires a few hobby implements. In my case, I simply use fine brass wire, a pin vise with a narrow drill bit, and a pair of wire cutters. Though in this particular situation, I find myself using a pair of needle nose pliers with a combination wire cutter that happens to be a little bit dull. Still, I won't let that hold me back. After all, the theme of today's video is working with what you got. That, and beautifying some ugly models. Digressing, we're going to go ahead and use our wire cutters to cut some various lengths of this fine brass wire. Generally, I'll refer to the artwork of the mix to determine the length of wire which is appropriate to make up their antennas. Of course, this is open to a little bit of artistic interpretation, and to stray outside the norm only adds some character to your models. For instance, I added antennas that were over 3 centimeters long to a king crab chassis once to really evoke a spiny lobster. Though in this case I'm using much smaller and much more reasonably sized antennas for these mechs. Once we've got the length of wire cut, we'll go ahead and affix it to the mech using the hole we've already drilled in the head. Super glue is usually the best bet to adhere this permanently and I especially recommend using an accelerator to increase the strength of the bump, though it's generally good to do some preliminary adjustments before spraying on the stuff. We'll do some post spray adjustments as well, but it's good to get the base in the right position before locking it in place permanently. Simply rinse and repeat with the remaining chassis and this lance is complete and ready for its faction specific paint jobs. Now that we're finished converting and basing these models, they don't look too bad even for being potato quality. In the end, I want to thank y'all for joining me today. We've went ahead and cleaned these models up and gotten them presentable and ready for the next video where we'll go ahead and slap some heraldric colors on them and prepare them as a proper lance for Battletech Day. Battletech's a great game and I highly recommend it. Whether you get started with an older starter set or the new modern variety, it's a fantastic game and you don't need many models to get started. In the end, I hope that you found this video fun and informative. I thank you for coming and joining us today and I hope you'll come back and see us next time when we get some more stuff done. Digressing, I've been Cameron on behalf of Country Fried Minis, and I want to remind you to stay happy while you're painting. Take it easy, fellas.